Hello, in this video we're going to continue our video lecture series on chapter 8 where we're looking at water. And uh, in our previous videos we had talked about some of the unique qualities, or I had talked about some of the unique qualities of water. And in this uh, video we're going to look at um, some of the different categories of water and their relative amounts. Uh, the uses of that water, what a water footprint is, and uh, some factors that either affect the availability or the quality of water. And so uh, it turns out that fresh water, uh, the kind of water we would use to drink and, and uh, do things in our house, wash our dishes, uh, is, is only a small fraction of the water found on Earth. So the majority of Earth's water is salt water uh, from the oceans, 97% of that. And then only 3% of that is, is fresh water. And if we look at the fresh water itself, not all of that is even available to us. Uh, almost 70% is in ice caps and, and glaciers. And... Um, and 30% it would be groundwater. So this is water that we would think of as underground, maybe in an aquifer. Um, and, and then we can also have surface water, which is what we think of as kind of the water that we, lakes and, and, and rivers and swamps, the water where we see the most. <laughs> um, and, and that's only 0.3% of the fresh water. So it's a very, very small portion of the total water on Earth. Um, and this is, this is saying what I just said. Um, but uh, an analogy is if, if this was two liters of water, all the water on Earth, only 60 milliliters, okay, or 0 0.06 liters would be fresh water. And the easily accessible water would just be four drops. So a very, very small amount. Um, another thing uh, we can look at is how water is used in the United States and the world. Uh, and most of the water that is withdrawn is fresh water, 86% of it. And only, even though salt water is the most abundant water on earth, it's not the water that we use much of, okay? And uh, what this slide shows is it shows um, this blue line is the total uh, withdrawals in gallons per day. And then these bars are some of the major uses of this water. And you, this is from the U.S. Geological Survey in 2010. And actually, you could Google this and, and you could find uh, this report and this actual chart. Uh, I know because I just did that earlier today. Um, and you can see that uh, the major use of, of, of water is thermoelectric power. Now, when we say thermoelectric power, this is not like a hydroelectric dam that you might see in some of the big uh, rivers uh, on the west side of the United States, like the Columbia River. This is water that is used in the process of of coal power plants and nuclear power plants they need water uh, because the for instance we saw that the heat from coal turns the water into steam and that turns a turbine and that gets uh, ultimately converted into electricity so that's what we say by so thermo is heat and um, so we're the majority of our water is used for electricity and then the next biggest use is irrigation, so for watering crops. And then uh, after that, we would have um, the public supply. So, um, so that you can kind of see how we use water in the United States. And it turns out that agriculture is 30% of, of global water consumption. So not much water, how we use water is actually used for drinking. It's for these other purposes. And the agriculture part leads us to another concept, and that is the concept of, of water footprint. And what a water footprint does is it estimates the volume of fresh water that we need to produce uh, maybe a crop such as grain 
or or some meat or some some other products that are food related or here we have a have a t-shirt and um, and uh, one thing to note about this is you can see that different products uh, have different water footprints so for instance wheat takes um, 1800 liters of water to generate one kilogram of food whereas beef uh, requires maybe nine or ten, nine or ten times that amount, and uh, there's probably various reasons for that. Uh, cows not only drink water, but they also eat grain, and you have to use water to make that grain. And so here's some common things that we might. Uh, all of these look like breakfast type items here. So, uh, and this 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 side always makes me. Uh, look a little bit bad, you know, I always feel, feel a little guilty looking at this because I, you can see tea is much better than coffee, but I always start my day with a cup of coffee and then I'm also wearing a t-shirt right now. So I'm not, I'm not a great example here. I'm just going to put that out there, but uh, you can see cotton's a, a big, has a big water uh, footprint. And in a couple slides, we're going to uh, actually see, um, one of the implications of that footprint. Okay, so now that we've kind of talked about the use of water, I want to talk about availability of water and availability of quality water. Because you see, we here in Michigan, we are surrounded by five fresh, I think these are all fresh water lakes. And so we have the most, I was actually looking this up earlier today, I think of all the states in the U.S. as a percentage of our, of our area, our land area, we have the most uh, fresh water. And so we're really lucky uh, uh, in Michigan, at least water, we're fresh water abundant, okay, as opposed to maybe um, Arizona that, that has less, less water. Uh, but there's other places in the world that, uh, than Michigan that don't have as much available water or it's not as high uh, a, a quality. Um, we've actually had water qualities here in Michigan now that I say that because uh, you may be familiar with the Flint water crisis where there was lead that was leaching into the water. Um, so one of the problems with the availability of water is we have a tendency to, to waste water. So we use a lot of water every day and a lot of that water goes down the drain in the process of it being used. Uh, a lot of our water comes from aquifers. So one of the most well-known ones is the Ogallala Aquifer. I think this might also be called the High Plains Aquifer in the textbook. And uh, if we use more water that can then can be generated, we can uh, the level of water in these aquifers can start to go down, and that could potentially become a problem someday. And it's already become a problem uh, at a an, in, over in uh, I think this is near Russia, a place called the Aral Sea, and you can see here this is a, a picture some pictures I found on on the internet from from this source. This is 1977, 1986, 1999, all the way through 2013. And you can see this, this sea like disappeared. <laughs> and, um, and there's a couple reasons for that. So uh, one is my t-shirt, okay? So, um, so the, a, a, a bunch of canals were built to um, provide water for uh, cotton in, in kind of an aril, ar, arid region, okay? So they were siphoning off all this water uh, for the cotton fields, and they weren't very efficient about it either because they used open canals, and so that led to a lot of evaporation of this water. And you can see uh, there's not much left of the uh, aril sea. It looks like Maybe things are a little bit better. I don't know. It's a little hard to tell. <laughs> it looks pretty dry. Um, okay, so that that's one concern is is overuse. Um, I think the uh, the textbook also mentioned something about 
climate, global climate change, and that can affect the timing of water cycles. And then a third thing to be concerned about is, is water pollution. And again, um, other than maybe Flint, <laughs> the occasional Flint, we have on the whole pretty good water in, in the United States. Our, our water kind of, this is from the Rocky Mountains, I think. Uh, it's, it's pretty good, good quality. Now, um, let's define, let's get the EPA definition of, of water contaminant because um, it, it means just because water has ions and it doesn't mean it's contaminated. Uh, you can have pure water or, or, or water that's safe to drink but still has magnesium and calcium and some of these ions can be beneficial. But a water contaminant is anything physical, chemical, biological, or radioactive that's harmful to human health or degrades the taste or, or color of the water. So maybe it, I don't know, tastes like iron or tastes like um, sulfur or something or it's orangish color. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, here's an example of a source. This is, this is acid mine drainage. If you just Google acid mine drainage, you'll get a bunch of orange pictures like this. Um, and some some things that can pollute water, abandoned mines, uh, runoff from uh, fertilized fields. When I was in college, I had a, a great example of this. Uh, I lived near, or yeah, my, my dorm was near what was called Lyman Lakes, and they always had a lot of algae. Not, well, not always had an a lot of algae on them. Uh, during parents weekend, the algae would kind of disappear just before parents weekend. But for the most part, it had a lot of algae and that's because you have nitrogen and, and phosphorus fertilizers and it was kind of an agricultural area. Um, and you can have uh, poorly constructed landfills and, and septic systems and they can leach uh, stuff into the to the groundwater. And then uh, our household chemicals that get poured down to the drain, they could, uh, they could pollute the water. So, uh, all right. And so that's going to uh, conclude this lecture. In the next lecture, <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, concentrations of things in water and solutions and solutes and solvents. So uh, thanks for watching. Bye for now.